Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is, is Joe. I work at the Centre for the Study of Early Agricultural Societies at the University of Copenhagen. Um, I also really like R, um, and I'm very happy that we have another session on R this year. The predecessor session to this um, last year is what really inspired me to take some code that was in pieces uh, on my computer and really try and bring it together um, and put it into a package that other people can use because, you know, as we saw last year, um, the, the Kiel group especially showed that that is not really as hard as it sounds um, and it's definitely worth doing. Um, but going, going back to basics to begin with, if we're thinking about the current state of R and its next directions, um, I think it's worth thinking about, you know, why why are we using R? Why is it becoming so popular in archaeology? Um, obviously, a really uh, uh, widely discussed reason is reproducibility, is making analyses more transparent uh, and open. Um, but I think also we should not forget that um, R, R itself is a powerful tool. Um, and so even if you take away the reproducibility aspects of it, um, there are a lot of benefits in terms of taking um, either methods, statistical methods that are currently used in archaeology, making them easier, making them more rigorous, um, especially if you're moving from a graphical statistical package uh, like, well, Excel would be the standard uh, platform in archaeology still, I think, to R. Um, also, you know, because the R ecosystem is so big, um, so diverse, it enables a lot of new approaches that have previously not been known or not been practical to apply in archaeology. Um, and and the, the answer is here is just to say, I think all, all, all these points also apply to other statistical programming languages, Python, Julia, um, I like R, but it's not unique to R. So uh, with my talk today, I'll, I'll be uh, demoing a, a package I've been developing, Fieldwalker, um, uh, and, and trying to point out some ways in which we can advance this agenda of reproducibility um, and, and ease of access. Um, so in terms of reproducibility, uh, we've made great strides in archaeology and in social science generally, I think, in making computational results um, reproducible or replicable. There's a bit of a terminological pointless argument there, but I'll stick with reproducible. Um, so that's sort of starting with open data using open software, open source software, preferably to analyze that data uh, and sharing your code. Um, but I think we're all aware that this really comes at the end of, of an archaeological research project. Um, we start with processes that happened in the past um, that led to material being preserved or not preserved. And all these steps between then and your interpretation are also places where we can try and improve the reproducibility or the replicability or at least just openness of um, archaeological research. So my package is kind of aimed at this early step of um, recovery methods, sampling, um, trying to open that up a bit uh, from the perspective of archaeological field survey. Uh, another widely discussed um, aspect of uh, the, the popularity of I, I mean, this is a figure that Ben, uh, ben Mike made it, but he uses it a lot, um, is this idea of researchers having to move from being T-shaped specialists, where you have um, a broad knowledge of a subject area, like archaeology, and then a specialism, to pie-shaped researchers, where you have that broad knowledge, domain speciality, but then also a parallel speciality in um, computational and statistical methods. Uh, I think this is maybe a bit more complicated than um, this figure implies. I would say that many archaeologists are already pie shaped um, because you know we tend to have a broad background education in archaeology. We then specialize in a period or a region, um, and then most archaeologists also specialize in a, in a material, like they, they work on zoo archaeology ceramics, etc. Um, so then to add computational skills to that, you're really adding a third leg, 
you're making stool shaped researches. Um, and I think at that point you may be starting to go a bit far. I, I don't know if it's practical to expect most archaeologists to be trained in such a wide range of techniques. Um, maybe some people can, but, but not everyone. And I think if it was possible for archaeologists to be domain specialists and material specialists and computational specialists, that would have happened already. Um, we would have seen wider uh, a wider adoption of tools like GIS, which have been around a long time. They have a, a shallower learning curve than R, uh, our scripting languages, and it hasn't happened. So what I would maybe propose as an alternative is that we stick to being pie-shaped researchers and see ourselves, us in this room, as people who specialize in archaeology and in computational methods. Um, and then we can think, okay, if we accept that not everybody is going to use the exact same tools that we use, how can we still make an impact on the wider discipline? Um, how can we make our, our packages or other software tools accessible to people who specialize in other areas of archaeology? Um, and I will suggest one uh, very straightforward approach to doing that in R is to create graphical user interfaces. Um, so the Shiny package, for those not familiar with it, is a, is a way to make uh, web-based graphical interfaces on top of R code uh, in a very neat, elegant way. It's very easy to use. I, I admit I had hoped I, had, I would have a, a fuller Shiny interface to show you today for, for my package, um, but I haven't got there yet. Um, but what I will show you is uh, this presentation, which is in itself a Shiny application. It's hosted on shinyapps.io. So it's actually a, an R Markdown document um, with embedded Shiny widgets that I hope to one day bring together uh, into a cohesive interface. So the talk is, is also the object of the talk. Uh, so back to the package, Fieldwalker. Um, I think I can go quite quickly through this because those of you who were at uh, Bintliff's talk this morning, um, you, you, what he was talking about was really the kind of issues that led me to want to develop this kind of package. It's uh, thinking about spatial sampling, a well-worn subject in, in landscape archaeology, um, but a very complicated one. And when I started doing some surveys and wanted to understand the implications that my sampling techniques were having on my results, I found that there, there wasn't a, a good platform for exploring those um, factors. Um, and that's what led me to develop this, this R package for simulating and uh, assessing sampling strategies, etc. So Fieldwalker is an R package, uh, I would call simulation framework for our surveys, for field walking. Um, it allows you to uh, explore theoretically the effects that different um, research designs would have on your results um, before you do it. Um, also, you can go back, reanalyze survey data you already have, um, think about whether there are any biases there that might be affecting. Um, and the, the conceptual framework I've come up with is to divide a survey into three main components. So the first of these is the, the actual um, target of your survey. Um, you can model this in many ways, but I think the most versatile one is to model them as a point process. Um, so then you can make use of um, uh, point pattern analysis based statistical methods. Um, so one wing of the package is, is to model the many, many different things that can affect um, the distribution of point data in archaeology, whether that's sites or individual finds or something in between. Um, and this is where a lot of the, the inputs of the package come in. So you, you, can, you can use real empirical data if you're doing a reanalysis, or you can do some more theoretical um, random processes. Uh, then we have um, the what I call the sampling function. Um, so all the various decisions you make when you're sampling a landscape, unless you have 40 years to, to 
survey at all, which would be nice, but not practical in most cases. Um, so, you know, all these decisions, where do you survey, how do you divide up the area, which units within that do you select? Um, and then the third and very, very important um, corollary to that is a uh, concept of a de detection function, uh, which is uh, I've taken from the work of uh, Ted Banning in Toronto. Uh, so these are all the things that um, affect the probability of recovering your target archaeological sites or archaeological material where you do sample. Um, and yes, so it's, it's, it's uh, implemented R. I don't think I need to, to argue for why R is a good idea in this session. Um, but uh, well, just to say that I also tried to take a, a very contemporary approach to R, so using tidyverse, using functional programming, um, and this whole uh, design paradigm. So uh, I'll quickly run through um, a, a demo of the package. Uh, you it's currently on GitHub, it's not on CRAN yet. Hope to get there soon. Um, a couple of the main dependencies are the Tidyverse, um, the SF package for um, updated uh, spatial uh, analysis in, in R, um, and also this random fields package is also very good for working with uh, field data and modeling fields in R. Uh, I, I say an old friend with SpatStat, SpatStat is, is actually quite key. To the package but it's I, I personally think it's showing its age and there are some difficulties getting it to work with these other paradigms so to take you through a, a, a typical analysis um, you start with the area you want to survey in this case I'm just generating a random blob then you have uh, uh, your, your target data again we'll, we'll generate some randomly and um, this might be a of sites. If we up the intensity of this um, log Gaussian Cox process that generates the sites, we could say, okay, maybe this is more like an artifact scatter, more dense. We'll eventually get there. Um, then we have various ways of um, dividing up the area, modeling our sample frame. So uh, mosaic, like a field system, or transects. Uh, it always does that. <laughs> there we go, grids. So grids, change your number. Maybe you don't sample all of them, you do a random sample of 50%, etc. cetera. So then just to step out of the demo for a minute, the, uh, the widgets, the shiny widgets that I've just shown, very easy to put together in R. You simply have this uh, way of defining the, the inputs and then Chinese takes care of all the layout for it um, nicely and automatically. Then there's some logic that maps those inputs onto field walker functions. So in this case, functions for different types of um, sample frames. And then finally, we just have a simple plot, ggplot based, that uh, will refresh as you as you change the form, um, these are what the detection functions look like. I've, I've actually changed these quite a lot since I did this presentation. But, um, so if we just stick with a simple detection function that says, "Okay, we detect seventy percent of the sites in our survey areas," we can then simulate the survey. Say, "Okay, these are the kind of results we would get." <coughs> Um, and then we can start to do some analysis. So um, some, some simple statistics you can make is, okay, how many sites do I manage to recover? Percentage, um, given the parameters of the survey that I've just run. Um, or taking advantage of the fact that we actually specified our point pattern as a mathematical model at the beginning, we can say, okay, it's not so important how many we got, but how accurate is our understanding of a spatial pattern? So if we can compare um, an estimation of the point process to the ones that we knew we actually gave it, see how close the, um, the uh, parameters are. Um, and then, then here I think the real 
benefit of that comes in in that is that you don't want to do what I've just done once. You want to do it a hundred times with a hundred different options. You know, really explore the parameter space of of the survey, um, and maybe end up with something like this. So, you know, here just altering the uh, the amount of coverage that we do um, in the sense of the proportion of survey units that we select. See how that affects the uh, root mean square error of our model estimation. Um, and so in this toy example, we'd see like, well, actually going beyond 50% coverage does not give us really any more significant information. So that's a, a quick run through Fieldwalker. Um, if you're interested, uh, it's on GitHub, ready to be installed uh, using the DevTools install GitHub uh, function. Um, this presentation is also on GitHub, the code or if you don't fancy trying to get our studio to build it, you can see it live uh, on, on Shiny Apps. Thank you for listening.